Welcome back. Thank you for joining us in this ever-deepening meditative journey into the depth of source life in the zone, primary reality, the field of reality. And this 11th meditation in the series, and the series is an ongoing series, uh, and they're not cut off, they're, they're, they're flowing together, ostensibly, hopefully, so that it's not separate compartments of meditation, but a, a, depart, a, a meditative flow that builds upon. So the prior meditations uh, have been setting the stage to go deeper into the science, the source science. And uh, in this 11th meditation, we really want to focus our, the source lens, the, the source science, the medical ontology, as we've called it. When we get, or somehow when we have the miracle of getting the missing source code that takes us into the fundamental field of infinite presence, of being, of reality, uh, on the primal field. And we can't talk about it, we have to perform it within. We have to enter within the word, within, within being, within the I am, within awareness, where we turn on the lights on our awakened self and our minds and bodies and human relations. And in the space of nature, in our culture, where the lights are on, in awakened reason, that's what we're, we're, we're spe speaking of as meditatively entering into the, the source life of where we thrive and fulfill our well-being and our being is healed at that point. So that last sessions we saw that the collective wisdom of the planet, but when we enter into the uh, missing source science, what we begin to see in the human condition from the source lens, from the global lens of, of deep reason, of deep ontology, of deep being, <clears throat> is that our human uh, development and evolution over eons has uh, arrived at a point of information and using codes, memes and codes and patterns of interpretation, mental patterns to metabolize our life which we have not sufficiently seen the full fallout and side effects and essential effects of using a motherboard and being used by a motherboard because it holds us captive. If we don't understand that there's a pre-conscious, deeply implanted pattern or codes that we're using to make sense of our lives and our world and nature and experience, it's all going on in an interpretation to be a human, to experience, is to make sense of it, to metabolize it. The data around us, inside, within us, and around us, we, our, our culture gives us tools, interpretive tools, to make sense of it, to name things, to, to, to understand relationships of how things relate and, and how the world is put together, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and what is rational and what is not rational. That comes from our culture, our culture codes. So the word code is like a law, a pattern, you know, a dynamic, a logistic, logistic meaning. What, what is the mind operating? So not only what's in the box uh, on the screen, but what, what sets up the screen and, and allows me to, to process uh, and, as I said, metabolize uh, all, that, all that appears to us. And different cultures have different codes, different worldviews. And the word view gives it away because it's a view. It's a, it's a way of viewing and interpreting and therefore making sense. And that's why I'm saying metabolize. We have to metabolize meaning. And, and that's our logos. And the word uh, logos, as we've seen, is the infinite logos, the infinite Sophia, the logos Sophia, whatever name we use for the infinite force, the infinite source. And many great names have been given in our great uh, diverse traditions and scriptures and first philosophies and theologies through the ages. <clears throat> but what we're seeking in this meditation is to do something astounding that has not been done. Because once we enter into the global lens, the source mind, the source code, and gain access to that I am space, the I thou, and, and tap language, uh, the power of language and word and mind and, and reason at that level, which is what all our great teachers have been calling us to, and opening portals to the space, all the enlightenment teachings and wisdom teach teachings of, of the ages. When we arrive 
in the source space with opening up the source lens and crossing out of the prior patterns and pre-conscious patterns and codes that have given us our culture and our cultural lives, they also give us pathologies seen in the source lens, in the source mind, at every aspect of our cultural lives. <clears throat> and our diverse cultures and traditions and, and ways of life across the planet can all be using that same motherboard. The motherboard is a technology of processing reality in our human development and the level of getting word power and reason power and consciousness mind power and lens power to process and interpret uh, reality. That technology can be shared widely and is shared across wide diverse worldviews and ideologies and religions, traditions, cultures, mythologies, stories, narratives. <clears throat> Because in a way, the narrative we're living, our worldview is a narrative, is a story. And the story is being used in that technology to set up the story, in the screen of the story. And our fictional worlds and our fictional writing, and fiction, you know, all of that is within the same space, using that technology. And what we've been seeing when we go meditatively into the deep space, into the source code of the awakened rational mind, of global lens, is that the codes that have dominated our human development and cultures across the planet in the 21st century and for centuries produces a breach with access to the source. It desources us. And many names have been given for that. It's been noticed for eons. This is not new. That, that there are many ways to say we're desourced. We're not tapping the fundamental field of reality. And that's a, that can be a human disaster. And our great teachers have seen that. that. That leads us to ways of death, patterns of death, and meaninglessness, and sophistry, and relativism, and the loss of having a ground for truth. And, and in that space, when we're desourced, it spawns all kinds of human pathologies to compensate for being cut off from authentic meaning, or authentic life force, the source, the source of knowledge, truth, meaning, ethics, goodness, love, compassion well-being. <clears throat> so everything we humans rightly strive for in our great religions and wisdom teachings and scriptures and, and religious visionaries of the ages in our biblical traditions and scriptural traditions have been calling us to move into well-being and flourishing. Come, come home to the source. If we're cut off from source, we're going to be in human existential suffering in all kinds of ways, and that's what we want to do in this session. <clears throat> we like meditatively to just go into the human condition from, with our source vision and source medicine and diagnostic tools and look at what's going on within human beings, in our lives, in our cultures, in our civic spaces, and, 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 and call out what would be direct breakdowns and dysfunctions and pathologies seen from the source lens and source medicine. Wherever we look in the human condition, that's really what we want to do in this session. And to, and to have a sense of why are these widespread pathologies and dysfunctions. And I think we'd agree that this is not the best way to be. This is not right. We know some of them are glaring, obvious areas of dysfunctions like sexism and racism, homophobia, you know, misogyny, hatred of, of, and violence to women, misology, logos, fear of the logos, fear of, of the higher source, uh, fear of the source, fear of our source self. For example, when we have a clash of worlds and violence across worlds and crusades and holocausts and genocides, ethnic cleansing, colonizing people, slavery, the violation of objectifying human beings, slashing nature, and violence to nature, and the abuse and gouging of our beautiful sacred environment. Everywhere we look, people would agree, those are pathologies, those aren't right. Addiction, it's, it's pervasive, the level of, of addictions of all kinds. What's at the heart of the addicted personality? What, what is the addiction? Often it's an attempt to medicate a, a problem that we know we're, we're suffering. Things aren't right. And, and whether it's alcohol abuse or excessive smoking or other substance, opioids, uh, 
other substances that we're used to. What we're trying to medicate something often. Of course, we're addicted chemically in our brain of chemistry uh, to, to some of these substances. What's going on <clears throat> with substance abuse? When we ourselves are making ourselves substances or entities, we're abusing ourselves. The, the slashing technology, the smotherboard, that's really the main point I want to get to, that when we do source science and get to the deepest level of diagnostic, what we couldn't connect the dots before and seeing wide-ranging breakdowns and dysfunctions in human life, wherever we look, in our rational life, we fall into sophistry. There is no ground of truth. When you're cut off from the source, you've lost the foundation of truth and the ground. And the great philosophers through the ages are, are, have known that if you're cut off from the source of truth, the, 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 the ground of truth, you're going to be in just opinion. And if it's just opinion, and we have all of these competing opinions and worldviews and narratives and ideologies vying for truth, but what, what is truth then? If you're cut off from the source, you're going to be in sophistry. And it's going to degenerate into relativism. There is no truth. Your story, my story, whoever's story wins. And since there's a competition for the main screen of here is the truth, science, we've got it. Our story is the right one. Religion, you're not the truth. Or one religion is saying, I'm the truth. Jesus is the ultimate truth. No, it is Allah. No, it is yoga, Om. No, it's Buddha. It's Moses, Abraham. And even there, Judaism, Christianity, Islam are supposed to be the children of Abraham in the same biblical shared tradition. And there's such war and violence taking place. The slasher, the slashing technology would, would lead to religious disorders. Fundamentalism, my religion is the only true religion. When it's in the box, when it's not touching the real source. If we're cut off from God, if we're cut off from Allah, if we're cut off from Yahweh, from Christ, from Om, from Buddha, from Tao, whatever name we use, if we're cut off from that, that's what desource means. We're going to be in the box. We're going to be suffering all kinds of hermeneutical disorders. Hermeneutical meaning interpretation. My interpretation is the right one. My truth is the right truth. And you privilege your own lens. When you privilege your own, your own story, your own whatever it is, amongst many worlds going on here, when you privilege and make it, this is first, number one, my story is number one, that leads to cultural breakdown. Because if we're living in, ostensibly in an open, say, in the American scene, the civic space is supposed to be ecumenical and open and pluralistic <clears throat> to many truths, even though we are alleging unum pluribus, that there, <clears throat> there is unity in the pluribus, in the, in the multiplicity, it's not just broken off there can be a pathological pluralism where it's just broken into fragments of different scattered narratives that have no link or connection. That's a pernicious pathological pluralism. Just broken apart with no common ground. Common ground is not here. Why? Because it's cut off from the ground, from the source. And so one of, one of the fallout of being in this motherboard that we said is a smotherboard, is it, 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 it comes with being desourced and cutting us off. And this line that comes with this technology of consciousness that gives us all of our worlds and cultures, this is our cultural space, and this is where we live. This is my mind. This is my lens. This is my psyche. And I can have multiple lenses, and therefore multiple stories going on on the screen of what is real and what is true. And my beliefs, I believe these thought stories. I judge. I believe. I interpret. All of these activities of the mind, they can be pathological if deformed and not tapping the source. So the, 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 what we're going into in this meditation is to be desourced, to cut off from here, and to, to, is to be, be in a fallout of, of atomic separate pieces that can't connect really, because the connections are here. This is huge. We've seen this over and over in our meditations. The double bracket space is a technology of, of deep dialogue in the Logos. Dialogos, in the Logos, through the Logos. That's dialogue, dialogue. And that's where you encounter the other in a nonviolent way because you have to give up privileging your lens when you cross 
from here where I have my lens and have my story. I know my truth. I've got multiple lenses. I've got my religious lens that gives me one truth. My scientific lens that gives me another truth. My ecumenical uh, uh, citizen lens that, that, that separates my politics from my from my religion, that gives me another truth. When I'm doing my yoga, that gives me another truth. My, my, my spiritual practice gives me uh, a certain truth, and so on. <clears throat> but, but here, we don't have the resource to link them in the true unity, the unum, that comes from the, the infinite unum connectivity of using the lens, the, the material lens, the rational logos lens, the logos code. So when we speak of the code, what code? We saw that to live in a culture is to have a code, a meme, a code, code, a pattern, whatever name you use for the code. And the code is given by the motherboard, right? Which is what? A is A. And that's, that's one of the dominant laws and rules in our development is normal and natural in our development. Uh, adolescent though it may be, to give name tags to everything, every word names and darts uh, an item, a unit. And somehow we, we act as if, of course, they're connected, and we have relations and connections in this space, but they're not, they're not real, they're not connections like, as they would be here. The connection of intimate love and intimate human relation in the zone of the source code, where we're tapping the unum power, the unum flow, is where my very being and your being are connected and interwoven in our otherness, we're still together. This is a healthy otherness. This otherness, I and other, when it's cut off from the other, I, and you objectify, without intending to objectify all that you attend to in the content of your experience under the motherboard, that's giving you the technology to, to put pieces together and make sense. That, and, and so here's the psyche, here are my language, my thoughts, and my words, and they picture reality out there. But when we go into the zone, all of these separate broken pieces come to a PowerPoint. So that as, we, as you move into a higher civilized life and culture here, the code of Logos, Sophia, the Om code, the Christ code, the Buddha code, the Allah code, the Tao code, the deepest science of the unified field code, is where all is interconnected flow. And that's where we become moral beings, rational beings, awakened beings. We touch the foundation of knowledge and truth and meaning and being. And we're one with being. And we have well-being. And this is life, liberty, well-being, freedom. This is freedom and liberation. Here it's not free. We wish to be free. We believe we're free. We, we, we feel we have agency and choice. But it's not deep freedom. Because we're saddled with a technology that holds us captive as if colonized by the dominant motherboard. So in a way, life here is enslaved, even though we feel we're free. And we say, I'm not a slave, I'm free. And we speak of that. It's still deeply entrenched within a dominant pattern that controls our minds and controls our lens and our interpretation, and therefore everything that appears. So that one of the themes you've seen, uh, as we now go deeper into the vast range of human breakdowns that come from being cut off from, 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 from the source. So we're trying to build a meditative encounter of what does life feel like here? When we look at suicidal issues and nihilism and sophistry and opinionism and absolutism and relativism and, and the range of, of, of cultural breakdowns and violence of sexism and racism and homophobia, ethnic cleansing and the violent blowouts and, and patterns of holocausts and genocides, ethnic cleansing, the clash of borders, the degradation of other humans, slavery, colonization, dominant Dominance over others, <clears throat> objectifying people. The greatest law of ethics is never treat a person as an object. Don't objectify a human. But that's what happens here. The objectifier, the slasher. This is a this code that, that gives us that what seems to be so pernicious, <clears throat> rather so so innocent and <clears throat> and 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 acceptable. A is A. Let's play that game. And we don't really realize that when you really play that game, unconsciously, pre-consciously, with your code of culture, and you start naming things and identifying them and trying to connect the dots and put them together, and the thinker in her space 
surrounded by inner space and outer space, is shaping her world with the code given by the culture. And the many different cultures, you know, is it, is it, is it Big Bang? Is it Genesis? Is, is, is matter the ultimate? Is, is spirit the ultimate? And then you get different stories. And then you have to duke it out here to say, well, which is the right story? In the marketplace of all of our different narratives, which is the right one? And we're trying to find truth here. <clears throat> and when you believe you have your absolute truth, you absolutize and privilege your story, your lens, your narrative over others. <clears throat> and if you're going to be pluralistic and say, well, look, there's room for all truths. <clears throat> Big Bang is true. Genesis is true. Om is true. Yoga is true. Buddha is true. Allah is true. And all the verse true. You have your truth. It's just local. There is no global truth here. Global truth doesn't mean there's only one story. Global means pluribus. Global space, when you open up the global space, is Allah true? In this space, Allah. Yahweh, Yahweh. Om, Om. Tao, Tao. Emptiness, Buddha, Dharma, the Buddha, Dharma. Christ, all of these truths don't compete and slash each other. They, they come scientifically out of the unum pluribus principle of the infinite word is infinitely connected, an infinite unum in all of the pluribus unum. The pluribus unum is the ultimate source code that flows with reality, the, the inner pulse of reality itself. That's what's being in touch with the source. And when we're in touch with the source, we're living in dialogue, we're living in harmony, we're living in the music, we're living in the compassion. We have life, we're touching life, the source of life. We're one and intimate with life with truth. In the beginning is truth. The word is truth. The word is being. You can't separate the word from being. You can't separate, you can't chop the word. If you say in the beginning is word, then word and being and meaning and truth and goodness and love and compassion, they're all connected. Space and time and color, figure, text, all the billion are connected in this deep space. I realize I'm speaking with passion about this in this meditation, but everything's at stake in this 11th meditation between when we're here and living here. And all of our great teachers through the ages have saying, come here to deep dialogue, uh, to compassion. This is compassion. This is ethics. This is reason. This is coherence, connectivity. We find that when we're here in the source code, all of these scattered, diverse narratives, you find the core, the source, the common ground here in the sacred common ground of the infinite unum pluribus. It's got to be that way because the infinite space, all life is happening within the infinite space and couldn't happen without the infinite word, infinite being, infinite source. The infinite word holding it and funding it. No word can step outside of the infinite word. All words come from the infinite word. All narratives, all belief systems, all perspectives, all ideologies. You couldn't have an ideology without the word. Ideologies are limited by, 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 by this technology, yes. And when you cross into the source, you leave ideology behind. To be an ideologue, people don't understand that. What is ideology? It's not just having one belief system. That's what an ide ideology is. It's a world view, a narrative belief system of certain, certain co commitments and truths and, and, and beliefs and ideas that you accept. So materialism is an ideology, idealism is an ideology, theism is an ideology, atheism is an ideology, science is an ideology. Religion can be an ideology. I, I, believe, in, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Gospels, I believe, I believe in Allah. I, I'm a practicing Jew, I have, I have the laws of Moses, I'm, I follow Buddha, I follow yoga, whatever it is, you can have an ideology here. So the slasher, the slashing technology objectifies experience. My feelings are here. So my inner feelings are still in this code. My feelings, my thoughts, my intentions, my hopes, my faith, my wishes, my beliefs, all here. We, people don't understand that. And the history of thought has been resonating with that. Our, our thoughts and the feelings are here. So if real faith is crossing out of this, dropping this, and entering into this knowing, knowing here in the source, Deep knowing, intimate knowing, where I and other, we know each other. I stand before the Van Gogh painting, I, and not on the museum wall as an object, but 
I encounter it and it speaks to me. And there's a deep inflow and dialogue and a connection, an intimate connection with self and other in the space. That's nonviolence. Because I'm not laying my interpretation, my lens on the other. I'm allowing, I'm opening my lens. That's global logos code. Open your lens to reality. Let reality show and inform you. Don't inform it. You, here you inform it with your layer story on it. <clears throat> so even at the level of, of, of truth making and meaning making you, and, and rational practice, there can be pathologies of absolutizing and privileging your lens over others. And if you say, no, I'm not going to do that, I believe in pluralism, there are many truths. Then you can degenerate into relativism, and okay, there is no one story, there are many stories, and they're all true, and all we have are relative absolutes. Every absolute, everyone is an absolute. We're going to have multiple absolutes. That doesn't solve the problem. There's a deeper technology of awakened, enlightened, reason and wisdom and truth and knowledge that our great teachers understood that when you go into the source space you're not imposing a narrative uh, on that space of identity you're, you're, you're entering into the, the aletheia, the disclosure the revelation of what is that's why certain great philosophers says if this is all we can know and what, what is knowledge? well I, I know that Socrates is wise, snow is white Rain is falling. The lights are on. I know that. Single bracket knowledge. To know a piece of information that is true, or even a cluster and a system of information. This, this knowledge is not the same as knowledge here. Because knowledge, in this technology, language pictures and represents facts out there in the world. And if they're true, then there's a correspondence between my thought and the, uh, and, and the fact. And if there is, if... I have a thought, snow is white, and snow is white, then it's true. And I believe it, and I affirm it, and I judge it. So all of our mental states, hoping, willing, judging, intending, but my agency, I, I want, I will open the window. I will open the window. Windows being opened, I will it. I, agency, agency, and choice, and action is coming from the thinker having thoughts to bring them out by her will to exercise my will in action. So action comes from thought. So when there's action like sexism and racism and homophobia and behavioral malpractice that are obviously violence in, in enslaving other people and, and humiliating other people and dehumanizing other people in, in all kinds of ways, well, we have to realize that the slasher is already creating a deep endemic violence in the cultural code itself. Uh, that may sound harsh, but our great teachers have seen that in many different ways. Our culture can be ill. Our culture can, can encode patterns of violence that we don't even recognize as violence. We can see certain extreme forms of violence and say, that's violent, and this is nonviolent. But in a way, when you're in this cultural space making your life, our lives, and practicing our cultural, what is meaningful and truth, uh, there can be endemic violence, because if this means I'm going to think about it, I think about it, I name it, right? I have thoughts, I have beliefs, I have intentions. And I see, I see others, I see others, and others are here. We are objectifying. This is the subject and these are the objects. But when you're in this space, the I dropping this, we have to let go of this, which is another major topic. How do you let go of a deeply pre-conscious implanted cultural code that gives you your culture and code and gives you the capacity to see and make sense and make a, and have a story and have an identity and give you tells you who you are you are your story and if your if your, your culture code is giving you that how do you let go of that you have to let go of yourself you have to shed yourself you have to shed your story is it just shedding your story or shedding the the story maker the, the technology and that is not, has not been seen because all of the, the yoga technology when Krishna is advising Arjuna who is broken down here in a fratricidal war you've got to let go. Of what? Of this. It's not fully explained that way. He says you've got to stop desiring. You've got to let go of the ego. If you let go of the ego self then your higher self will arise. Right? But to let go of the ego it's not just to let go of your story. It's to let go of, of, and to keep this. If you keep this you're not getting out of it. That's the point. All of our great wisdom teachers, 
to Saul that we've got to make a crossing. And the rite of passage is deep and scary and life-threatening. Krishna says to Arjuna, don't be scared, Arjuna. A little faith in this, a little faith in your high self will keep you from great harm. What harm? The feeling of being threatened in your life, in your story. Don't take that lightly. If your story and you are, your, your story is your narrative. That's who you are. And all the network of relations and truths and beliefs and, that you have. Uh, and to, to let go and make this crossing, you have to let that go. Not just this in here, but this. You can't take this with you here. This code has to be, whatever it served, the dominance of information and absolute separate identities and making links across separate units, whatever that did for us, is a kind of a digital calculus, a logic, a zero-one logic. It's an objectifying logic. It's information. It's artificial intelligence. When you go into deep intelligence, into source intelligence, and, and become one with the source, you've got to let go of the slasher. And the slasher is mental violence, ontological violence. And a moral teacher has understood that never treat a person as an object, but if I'm treating myself here, I objectify myself, I objectify you, I objectify my children, I objectify other people, other cultures, other religions, nature. If you objectify, then watch out, there's very likely going to be deeper violence from that initial violence. This is huge because it, it, it's suggesting that that to be a, a, a nonviolent person, and persons are noble. Humans are here. Noble humans have to let go of the slasher and the objectifier that cuts you off and reduces this word here. When you take the word, the source word, the Christ word, the God word, the Buddha word, the Allah word, the Tao word, and put it here in our word, something dismal and violent happens to slashing the word. If Christ is here speaking, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the word, the logos in the flesh, and we violate the word, we are, we are putting God to death. Theocide. If we put infinite word here in our finite space with identity and try to do my theology, what, is the, what are the predicates of God? What theology wants to know? What are the... The attributes that belong to God. God is infinite. God is goodness. God is love. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God creator of the world. And we, can, we talk about it and, and, and we don't realize that without intending to do that, to inscribe this word here is to violate it. The source is being violated. So being, which is what? Infinite presence. Not, not an object. Being is not an object. You can't objectify being. What is being? Being is an infinite flow of reality. Being is one with source. Being is the Logos. Being is Allah. Being is Yahweh. Being is Om. Being is the Buddha field. And if you're cut off from it by your technology of consciousness and culture making and self making and how you interpret and process the word in the word factory, in the word machine, because a word is infinitely connected. All words come out. All stories, all narratives, all scriptures come out of the infinite script. That's what this means. We are always tapping it. And these stories, this technology is a layer. It's a layer upon that. It cuts it off and it imposes an abstraction. This is not the real deal. When I have relations, if I say, I love you, it's not the same as I love you here. That's the deep love. That's a real love. The, the, the source relations are intimate flow, non-violent, co-arising. The musicality and the harmony of coherence, of reason, that's reason. And that's, that's deep logic. This is healthful. This is organic. This is wholesome. My being becomes healed and whole. Here, here it's broken and stressed and objectified and cut off. And with that endemic violence, once we objectify the other and ourself and violate ourselves with our very technologies violating us, I cut myself from myself. I cut myself off with this technology. I cut myself. I slash myself. That's why I call this single slasher. 
And this is the double bracket. The double bracket is embracing. The infinite embraces the whole. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a gentle inclusion, inclusion open-ended, open space, sacred space. It's a sacred technology. And we cannot be a person here in this very we inherently objectify. And when we objectify, we, we're doing damage. And if we objectify our children, children are born as logo sapiens. They're, we're beautiful, sacred beings who are given to our the parents. They love this child and raise her as a human. And if we unconsciously don't know that the, the codes of our language and our patterns of uh, of setting up our worlds and making our worlds and ourselves and our cultures and meaning and truth and belief systems and narratives and lenses, and we re replicate that with our children in this factory, we could be violating our and passing it on generation after generation, which is what we're doing. So this line has a deep existential from source science. This line is called sin in the biblical world. In the biblical teaching, in the script, the biblical well, sin is cut off from source, from God, from sacred space. And to be cut off, the wage of sin is death. That's not a light, frivolous diagnostic. It's true. Because what is death? Well, when you're processing your life here, and it's terminal, and you're a being, and the being is going to end and terminate, and death is going to come in here. Well, death is different understood here. Because being cannot die, source cannot die. When you are in the Christ, in the Buddha, in the, in the yoga, in the Om, in the fun, fundamental field of reality, when you are here, that, that, the, the phenomenon of death is a different death than death here as a terminal, existential terminal disease. Where you're going to be obliterated, you're going to be not from being to non-being. So the wage of being cut off from source is facing the specter of death as a terminal that haunts your life at every moment. And that's already going to set in motion all kinds of human pathologies. The suicidal thoughts. If, if, if we're cut off from meaning, if meaning is here and the light turns on, turn on the light, come into the daylight, come into, into the Logos light, enlightenment, Come into being, come into truth, come into meaning, and the, the Atman, right? The, the, the Gandhi space, for example. Turn on the lights. That's enlightenment is here. It's not here. You can't turn on the lights here. It's dark. And the technology of, of everyday culture, it's a subculture. So that's colonized. And it's violent. And it objectifies. And therefore reduces. It takes a sacred word and brings it down here. And therefore God is dead here. As Nietzsche would say, God is dead and we killed. Why? Because, or the Tao, that his name is not the Tao. Or don't write the name of God. Why? Because we're going to write it here. And if you write it here, you're, you're violating the sanctity of God. And if you have your idols here, your stories and your lands, you're going to have idols and idolatry. And not the real worship. So you can have a religious pathology. You can be mistaking the word of God and the word of Christ and the code of Christ, which is here for our codes which are here. And I could avow that I believe in the Gospels and I believe in Jesus and I follow the laws of Moses and I, 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 I worship Allah and I do my prayers and I have faith in this space. And that could be a distortion of, of authentic, spiritual, uh, awakened religious practice and consciousness to be in the source, in the code. And the faith here, faith is to know this. Faith is knowledge of the Logos that's in us. And when we tap the faith, we're here. And that is medicine, and it heals. And to be cut off from that, even though we use the words, we use all of these, we use the word reason, but reason is deeper. We use the word faith, worship, prayer. What is prayer? The, the, it's not, the prayer is not the ego praying. Pr prayer is entering into the deeper word. It's meditative, not predicative. Predication is this technology. You predicate subjects and predicates. You join them, you make meaning, you make your belief systems, and your mental states are predicated. And predications, they're bits and pieces of information. They're mind bits and psychological mental states that are separated. And therefore, you can't be a whole, continuous, unified psyche. You could be living in multiple worlds with multiple identity. 
And that's a kind of ontological schizophrenia. You have multiple personalities and you don't know how to bring it together. You're living across multiple worlds. You have different lenses working, different stories going. And you're, you're buying into them. You have different IDs in each of those worlds. In my religious world, I have one ID. In my scientific world, another ID. In my political, ecumenical, civic space, I have another ID, and so forth. How do you bring those worlds together? Well, you need the source. You need the, the, the unum code, the continuum to heal and deal with healthy multi multiplicity. It's healthy to have multiplicity. Why? Because we're not just one entity. When you're here, you're, there's a fractal power in the self. The self is fractal. It has multiple narratives. It can dance across multiple narratives and worlds in a healthful way because you're in the source, you're in the code. You've got the code power, you've got the word power, the narrative power. This is narratology, the logos of narratives and lenses. I can be a scientist, I can be a religious person, I can be in one religion and embrace Jesus, and I can do yoga and embrace the, the Om without being busted or unfaithful. Because if you really are faithful to Jesus, or Moses, or Abraham, or Allah, or Buddha, then you're going to see that these are interconnected. If you really understood the Christ code, you will see that the Krishna and Christ and Buddha and Socrates and these great geniuses who are tapping the code, they're, they're code partners, brothers and sisters in the code. Allah does not compete with Yahweh and, uh, and Brahman. The infinite names, the infinite word has infinite names. And when we name them in our tribal ways, this is a tribal space. It's a colonized space. It's localized. It's not global. It's local. And we cannot do honor and justice to ourselves as global sapiens or to our, our sacred scripture that we allege to believe. We put it in our belief system and we have it here and it becomes an ideology and a kind of ideology. And it degenerates into pluralism, multi-truths, multi and there's no connection because it's lost the, the, the contact with the source and therefore you enter into a relativism. Truth is relative. Or an absolutism, you absolutize your story against the others, and that's also a degeneracy. Absolutism and relativism are partners in this space. Theism and atheism are partners. There is God. No, there is no God. Is and isn't. They're both in the box. The opposite stories, one, many. Is, isn't. Unity, diversity. Is unity true? If unity is true, then down with diversity. If diversity is true, then down with unity. But we can't find the unum pluribus inscribed in the American penny in the deep polis, the civic space here. If America were here, for example, the civic space of democracy, demos, we the people. What does we mean? We are together in pluribus unum. We're diverse. And every, it's not just we're diverse according to, to race and class and, to, uh, and gender. No, it's deeper than that. Every person is sacred. Every human is unique and sacred in the infinite space. Every person has her unique PowerPoint and is therefore sacred and encodes the infinite within her. That's how deep it is, the diversity. And yet connected in the unum pluribus. That's where culture is waiting to happen. That's we the people. Hove a power, but here we can't be we. We're a collection, we're an association, we're a bundle, but we're not connected. Where's the community with diversity? We're longing for that. Those are pathologies, political pathologies. So everywhere we turn, this is really the main point I'm seeking in this meditation to help us see is it's not see uh, that when you have the lens of the source board and the source the code. And you can say, let's look at the human situation, not from here, from here, within here. You cannot really get a deep read. But when you go into the medical ontology and say, wow, look at what sexism is and how certain stories and narratives of objectification that say women are being objectified or men are being objectified or children are being objectified. Or look at the, the, the environment and the devastation to the environment. Nature is sacred. But look what we're doing when you're gouging and taking out the rainforests and, 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 and the and pollution uh, of, of the air and the ozone and all the different things we see. Nature, nature is in a meltdown. Why? Because it's objectified, which means well, it's a commodity. It's there for our mastery. We master 
nature is an object. Once you objectify, then watch out. If you objectify that other culture, it could be Holocaust. She is like objects. Destroy them. Burn them. Enslave them. Capture them. Colonize them. That's not human. That's not ethics. That's not spirituality. So when we objectify and de-source, so as I was just about to finish that thought, in the, in, the, in the biblical West, the sin is a deep cut and alienation of our lives. We're fallen, the great fall of humanity. Whatever mythology you use, bottom line is we are cut off from grace, from faith, from communion with source. And our religious rituals are meant to move us from the alienated cut off into communion. So when I do the sacrament of communion, the Last Supper, when you break bread, when you break bread here, it becomes bread. So, so the, the passage of, of rituals is not to do a ritual here. The rituals are meant to take us into the sacred space, into communion. Communion is here. Union, communion is here. And disunion and separation and sin and alienation and being cut off. So that in, in the biblical tradition, in the Christian tradition, the pathway for salvation of your being is to go from being cut off and alienated into one with Christ. And belief in Christ here is not going to accomplish that. What is a belief? A belief is a, a, embracing a thought. I believe snow is white. I believe the door is closed. I believe that I'm a man. I believe our beliefs are embracing pieces of, of, of thoughts. That we, I embrace it. I, I affirm it. Yes, I say yes or no. I say yes or no. I embrace, that's a belief. But belief here is when you are in belief, in deep belief, you have knowledge. You're intimately connected with the other, with nature, with, with a painting. If I'm looking at a painting and I'm having a deep link with it, and I'm not putting my lens on it and objectifying it, which I do here, and allow it to interact in, in this infinite interactive connection. That's intimacy. That's deep art. That's aesthetic beauty and, and appreciation. That's ethics. That's religious. That's sacred. That's science. To know nature, truly. Not to objectify. So when we use our lens on it, we objectify it. When you objectify it, watch out. Because once objectified sexism, racism, self-privileging, colonizing, slavery, using others, and not really treating others as sacred. And, and when one is cut off and living in this space, so I, I, I just to, again, complete a thought, I'm going fast, but in the East it's called samsara. What is, the human condition is samsara. What's that? Being in a cycle that repeats itself. Why? Because it keeps using the same code of, of attachment and desire and identity and an I'm a story and you're buying into the addiction. There's an addiction a chronic, deep addiction, a pre-conscious addiction to a pattern of consciousness that makes our culture and chops things up and cuts us off and we don't know how to get out of it. We don't know we're in it. We don't even know we're in it. We don't know we're here. All we know is this. We don't know we're in this. And so we suffer. At every aspect we turn in life. Can I find love if my other is an object and I'm here and I'm cutting off and I'm cut off from me and I'm not in touch with my high self? How can I enter into love? I'll have codependency. I'll say, I love you. But, but somehow in that space, when you're objectifying each other in monologue and using your lens on the other, and there are all kinds of gender wars that take place. Men are from Mars and women from Venus. They, they, they're, they're in different places where they have different lens and they have different stories and different interpretations of what they're, what's going on and what's not going on and feelings and emotions and sexuality, and no sexuality. Erotic life gets cramped and damaged and objectified into perversions and distortions when we objectify each other and not understand that our bodies are sacred. We're temples of the source. And lovers are sacred temples for each other. Not objects to be used for gratification of your psychic needs and physical needs, whatever it may be. 
So everywhere we turn in the workplace, there's objectification of one another. It's like a machine operation and not a civilized space. In the political space where we vote and, and meet each other with our different narratives and perspectives, there's a battle for different whose interests are going to dominate. And let's have a vote. And who wins? Just need 51% or whatever percentage you need or whatever electoral college you need, whatever it is, right? The majority wins. What happens to the others? Where are the we? If there's an ideology that dominates right now, left or right or whatever, uh, Republican or Demo Democratic or Independent or whatever the narrative that dominates the, 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 the life of the people in an alleged civic space and pluralism, is that real democracy? Where in our sacred diversity we can meet honorably in consensus and consensus and, and care, care, mutual care in nonviolence with nature and the environment and the economy. <clears throat> this is where justice arises and human rights, human rights, we have a right to be. This is huge. If we're here, our being is busted, our being is cut off. So whether it's samsara in the East or sin in the West, those are code words, ancient code words for something is wrong, we're cut off from being. And so what is the medicine of our great scriptures and teachings? You've got to find a way to cross from being cut off and lodged in a deep addiction and pattern. You've got to kick this habit and rehabilitate to be able to stay in the, in the high space, in the Atman, in the Buddha space, in the Christ space. So Christianity is here, the love of Christ, to be Christ, to love Christ, to enter into the salvation, in, in the kingdom of God is at hand. The key, this is the kingdom of source. The kingdom of source is at hand. It's, it's always here. We, we cut it off, but it's here. It's here in every breath at all times. So to say it's at hand, it's as close as your hand, right here. So nirvana, in B Buddha or yoga, when you enter nirvana, you enter being. And that's well-being, and we have a right to be. I'm going fast. But I'm, 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 what I'm seeking to do in this meditation with you is to is to put together what we usually can't see as connected. This meditation is a seeking to say, wow, I didn't realize that when I'm raising my children and I may be objectifying them and, and, and using my slasher and teaching them how to slash and using my lens on my other and not seeing and listening to my child in the sacred space of parenting. Here, let the child speak, see her, tend to her, be present to her. This is presence. In deep source time, it's presence. Be present. And that's the art of deep dialogue. That's nonviolent. With your lover, with your child, with your partner at work, with your co-citizens and your neighbors, allow them to speak and be and show up. Show up in an open, this is open space. This is an open mind. This is a mind that's not open here. I got, I, I got my blinders on. I got my, my lens. I'm seeing you with my lens. This is monologue. Mono. Monologue, mono is a, a virus. This is a virus. The slasher is a virus for everything that's going on here. Everything. Not only the extreme cases of say that's sexism or that's racism or, or that's radical ideology. But everything is ideology here. If we're cut off from the source, we're cut off from truth. We're cut off from meaning. We're cut off from the source and foundation of knowledge. And that's been the great quest of the centuries. So when Descartes, the, the great uh, first philosopher, the meditations and first philosopher, he realized in his deep meditation, not predication, but he realized, I can doubt all of my beliefs. Is there anything certain? Is there anything that, that's absolutely noble that I, that I can really hold on to and believe in? No. Is there anything that I can know? He saw to his amazement that he can doubt everything, all of his beliefs and mental states. He, and his story is going on here. He, because he's processing himself here. So, so if all of our beliefs, when they're not grounded, when you're cut off and ungrounded and unfounded and cut off from reality, what's, what's really true when you press reason to the limits and question and inquiry and open critical thinking and you press it to the limits? What holds up? What narrative holds up on its own terms here? It doesn't. It's ungrounded. It's unfounded. And so the quest of genuine reason and science is a crossing into... So when Descartes said, I'm going to step back from this, I'm, I'm going to act as if 
all of my beliefs and my culture and my narratives that I've grown up with, even mathematics and, and, and deep rational science, that could be wrong. These beliefs, I'm, I am separated from our... What if there's a demon of doubt that comes in right here? I am separate from my beliefs. And what if there's a demon that's trying to trick me to believe it? When it's false, to control my mind. And even worse, what if I have self-deception? That's another pathology. If, what if there's a, a, a deep Freudian, if I'm sabotaging myself and there's a me, a, a multiple me, and I have an alternative self that, that is undermining myself because I'm, I'm open up to diverse alternative identities and I'm cut off from my deep self, what if there's an intervening force that wants to deceive me never to get truth? And they can't face that scary specter. When we humans go in deep inquiry into that depth, and realize, wow, this, what I thought was meaningful, may not be meaningful. Even though my, my beliefs, and I have faith in this, and this is my worldview, and my identity, and who, are, who am I? Socrates asked, know thyself. Above all, know thyself, who am I? And you can, can you know yourself in a pre-rational technology that produces, yeah, information and beliefs, and, and thought forms? And giving us our world, and our, uh, it's our it's our factory of interpretation because experience is always interpretation. We've gone over that. To experience is to metabolize, to, to use a lens. To have you need a lens. Your your code, your culture gives you a code and a lens. So ah, oh, I can make sense, and I can make sense and have meaning. But what if the meaning is not grounded in the source? This is meaning. The infinite word is the source of meaning. So the quest for the foundation, the ground, and the common ground of our diverse beliefs and, and world ideologies and, and worldviews and religious scriptures understood here, is found here. That's deep knowledge. Knowledge is great. Te when you really have knowledge here, you're not, you're not laying a lens on the other. The split between the subject and the object leaves room for constant mistake and, and, and failure to encounter directly. But in the deep space of deep dialogue, Dialogos, the, the, the I and the other ex experience the mutual enhancement and the mutual mirroring in a nonviolent way. So that the psyche here and knowledge here and belief here. So when Descartes said, I am, I exist, I, that's true. He was, in effect, crossing out of this cut off, severed technology into the meditative I am. And when you say, I am, you am. Listen, you're not describing, you're not just getting a belief. Descartes' meditation is not here, it's here. It's in the I am space. I am. God is. He saw that infinite being must be. The infinite being must be. Basic axiom. This genius saw it, Descartes. But we read Descartes here. We read Jesus here. We read Moses here. We read Muhammad here. Many of us. Rumi sees it here. The great Islamic poet, philosopher Rumi. When he says in that often quoted, there's a field beyond judgment and belief and knowledge and disagreement and, 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 and this stuff. There's a field beyond this stuff. I'll meet you there. See ya. I'll meet you there. I'll meet you. Truly meet. This is I thou meeting. You truly encounter one another here in the civilized space of deep dialogue. Deep dialogue is medicine. And we can't have democracy without deep dialogue. This is huge. It means that if your culture is here, using this technology, you can't have real uh, democracy. There cannot be we the people. There will not be real community. And so even in, in Christianity, how many sects of Christianity, sectarian? Where does that come from? From, from this sectarian chopper. This is a sect, this true is it. So of, of the many denominations and sectarian, all the way. And so too with Buddha. Which tradition of Buddha are you? The Hinayana, the Mahayana, the Madhyamika, which, which Pure Land Buddhism? We, which we, we sectarian? Because the chopper keeps putting alternative narratives, and then this is a place of truth. So let's let's see if we can dominate this space with our story. And science uh, alleges that we've got the right story, we've got the facts. Our lens is the right facts, and religion and other approaches medicine, let's use science for medicine. Acupuncture, ah, eh, that's not medicine. Naturopathic medicine, no. 
these other alleged medical, uh, you know, we want integral medicine. No, integral medicine is here. Integral is not here. This is disintegral. The technology is disintegrates. And so the human being cannot be a whole being. You've got to be a whole being here. This is healing, crossing. All the great teachers knew that. That was the essence of Buddha's teaching. This is suffering. We're addicted to a pattern. We have a choice, and we can cross and rehabilitate our mind in the Buddha pattern in the Buddha code, in the source code. What then? Compassion, love, nonviolence. You see yourself in the other and in nature and all things are interconnected. You're tapping the science of the flow, the reality, the feel of reality is interflow. This is huge. Yoga. Krishna says, come into the Om space, Arjuna. Drop your stuff. Let it go. You got So all of the great teachers know that there's a rite of passage from the immature level of being a human and immature rationality and, and belief systems and knowledge and truth and being and, and so forth and meaning. Meaning is immature here. Come to the mature. And how do you do that? You've got to let go of something. What's that? Deep sacrifice. What does that mean? It doesn't mean, you know, if you, you, you don't give up your son. You have to give up the attachment to your son. Meet your son here. Gain your son. Don't objectify your son. Release your son so that you can have your son and become a father and a mother and a lover and a citizen and a healer. This is the healing space. So ontological medicine, the yoga, the Buddha, the Christ, Socrates, enter the logos and know thyself. This is a logosphere. This is a logosphere, but it's warped and deformed by this technology. And we suffer here. This is a place of pathology, dysfunction, suffering, racism and sexism, Narcissism, being living in your bubble of your own narrative story, whatever it is, and being cut off from the other, objectifying others, colonizing others, abusing others, loss of meaning. So that, as in Descartes' experiment, when, when, when the child is growing up and she's realizing that this doesn't make sense. I know the culture thinks that's normal. This is normal culture. But normal culture can be sick. The culture code could be warped from a, a high culture where humans can breathe and love and flourish. We have a right to be. So the quest in the American visionaries of life, liberty, freedom, well-being, we have a right to be, may not be here. Maybe the vision of the American visionaries was seeing into, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all persons are endowed by the source with unalienable rights, life, liberty, well-being. That kind of talk is here. Double-bracket America is a polis, a sacred polis, a civic space. We have to let go of a, a warped, damaged, uh, deforming civic space where it's, it, it's, it's a culture war across ideologies. And that's a kind of ideological extremism. And when you get here in, in the marketplace of the global culture, all of these worlds vying in a, in a global space, and you get violence of all kinds, ethnic cleansing. You know, people are driven from their homes of violence and, and bombings and suicide bombings and, uh, and crusades and jihads in the name of one name here. All of that is warped. And the great teacher says, you've got to let go of this in order to cross over. And that is scary. That's the point. It's very scary to let go of what's familiar, our stories, our culture code, as we know it. Because it seems as though it's going to die. And that's why it's often said you've got to die to be born. The rite of passage here is enormous. It's scary. And therefore there's deep phobia in the self for its high self. Do I dare allow myself to be? Do I dare face my high self? There's autophobia, fear of the self. And some of our gifted poets and visionaries have said, well, what we fear is not how small we are or insignificant, but how great we are, how magnificent, how sacred, how beautiful we are here. That's scary to handle this. And we've got to grow up. Because it's compassion, it's love. It's a place of justice and dignity and human rights. Human rights are wronged here. We can't really be. Our being is boxed. It's cut, cut off. So naturally, there are existential traumas and, and, and pathologies here, too. Just giving examples. 
when someone has a, a, a midlife crisis and her life, her world collapses, her world view collapses, it means, again, she sees this is not it. I've done all the right things according to my norms and culture codes, and I've, 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 my, I've taken care of my family, I've paid my mortgage, my kids went to college, and I've had a job, I've got my retirement, I've got 401k, but you know what? I feel empty. I feel empty. So many people feel that. At all, hey, kids feel it. Kids have a midlife crisis in junior high school. They realize this doesn't feel right. There are cliques that are forming in the junior high school. There, 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 there's violence going on. There's bullying going on in school. What's wrong? Everywhere we turn, we're seeing signs of what? Of being cut off from, from flow and compassion and source and knowledge and faith and dignity and nobility of being a human. Humans are here. We're Logos sapiens. Not mono sapiens. The word sapien, as you know, means wisdom. Sapiens. And homo sapiens, wise species, humans, are because we have reason. We can use words. We have meaning. So we're homo sapiens. But that really is not really good enough because sapiens, wisdom, is not information. Wisdom is entering into the zone of being. The call to the Logos, to live the Logos, to be in the Logos. That's wisdom. Wisdom is not here. It's here. So if anyone is teaching wisdom in this space, this is another whole huge topic we'll pick up in the next meditation. Because we've been, in our meditative journey, trying to help us see that we're always in the Logos, double bracket space. We need to see the double bracket so we don't bring it down into the single bracket and, 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 and mask it here. So we disentangle them. This is huge. So just having double bracket, single bracket, to see the difference between life here and word here and meaning and, and faith and religious practice and culture and democracy and raising our children and our love life and our sex life and all aspects of human relations here is very different than it is in the deeper space. To see this distinction between a double bracket technology and code and the Logos code here and the wisdom codes and the enlightenment space and this is extremely important. Single bracket, double bracket. This has not been seen clearly in our human evolution. And this is monumental to see this. It should alarm us because it's alarming what's going on in this, in this subculture cave and this cut from source and how this being cut off is going to show up in all kinds of pathological dysfunctions. That's the main meditation. Where if, if we had a face-to-face -face conversation to follow up on this and you'll take something like, how about someone who is feeling suicidal? and say, you know, I don't want to be here. I, I, this is so empty. I don't want to be here. And it's right in a way. I don't want to be here. I want to be there. But that's all they know. All they know is here. The only way is to out it. Uh, so, so almost like being driven to suicide as an extreme breakdown in pathology of the loss of meaning. And no raison d'etre. There's no reason to be. Because reason is being. Here's the raison d'etre. Here's the enchantment. Here's the, the exhilaration, the joy, the motivation, the logomotive. Not the ego motive, the mono motive. Mono is a virus, being monocentric and in monologue. So I try to have dialogue here, and I know that Jesus is my truth, and you know that Moses is your truth, and you know that Allah is your truth, and you know that science is your truth, and we sit around the table and we have interfaith dialogue. No, as long as we're in here, we can't have dialogue. We have to move into the high space of dialogos to open up the mind to encounter one another. The Christian can, can encounter the Jew, and the Jew, the Muslim, and the Muslim, the, the, the scientist, and the scientist, the, 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 the yoga. And, and see that we're dancing together. We can't not be. We're all in the same code, the deep source code. That source is all. And, and that's what I'm demonstrating, that once you have the source code, the, 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 the missing source code, and you know that all narratives are being co-sourced, it cannot not be. Then you have, the, you, have the, you have the key. The code is a key to say, oh, I see that the biblical world and the sign Genesis and Big Bang, as diverse as they are, when you get into the deep space, you can begin to see the analogs, the connections. You could see the analog between Allah and Yahweh and Brahman and Buddha field. You can begin to see that the ethics here of compassion and when Jesus is saying, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. He's speaking this code. And when Buddha says, when you're in the Buddha space, you will see compassion. Those are tapping the same axiom of ethics. You can see it now. It's, you can't see it here. 
with this lens, you've got to go deeper. And that's been the journey of human evolution, to go from the single bracket to the double bracket intelligence, to mature. Just like the, the caterpillar has to become the butterfly, the ego pillar has to let this, shed this skin and morph with the imaginal cells to rise into the Buddha fly, the fully blossoming human. That's our evolutionary maturation as a species. Here, this is a human species about to be born. Our cultures, our democracies, our religious life. Because Jesus here is not the same as Jesus here. Jesus in the box, single bracket Jesus is not the double bracket code. Buddha here is not so much of Buddha's teaching for 2,500 years. If you see the Buddha, kill him. It's not the Buddha. Why? Because the Buddha was fighting this. The Buddha was saying, don't objectify and make an entity and make an entity of yourself. You're going to suffer. And that's the pathology we're talking about. The breakdown at all fronts is not human intimacy. There's not human dignity. There's not ethics. There's not rational coherence. Deep science. It's sophistry. It is opinionism. It's ideology vying with one another for spin doctors to get the truth and, and dominate the space with whatever your, your preferred narrative space would be. And it degenerates into absolutism or relativism, flip sides of the same pathology. Absolutism, to absolutize your local story as if it were global truth, is a pathology. That's absolutism. Or, no, they're pluralist. They're many different. Everyone has their truth. That is a flip side of absolute. They're the same boat. Absolutism and relativism are in the same boat. Theism, atheism, in the same boat. Knowledge, skepticism, in the same. Who's a skeptic? Because there's nothing we know. To be skeptical about knowledge in a way is right, because the, the, the skeptic here is saying, we can't find knowledge here. But the skeptic here is a dupe. Or the person who is saying, there is no God and is tapping the God space, is duped. To deny God is to affirm the word. You use the words to affirm and to, to make your denial. Affirmation plus or minus, S is or isn't, affirm or deny, yes or no. I can say yes or no, affirm or deny. You can, if I say God is, is real, no, God is not real. We're in the same boat. So the isms, theism, relativism, Christianism, Islamism, Judaism, Buddhaism, Yogaism, Scienceism, all the isms are using this technology and having an ideology that is affirming to be the ultimate narrative that I subscribe to. And the great teachers knew you've got to go beyond the isms. You've got to get out of this box and go into really awakened mind, awakened truth, into the fractal space rather than the atomic separate pieces to understand the sacredness of the flow of high culture. That's a lot. I hope I'm not scaring you. <laughs> this, to, to see it all at once, I hope, is helping. I feel, I hope it is relief. I says, because we all know this. We all know that our kids are crying out in pain. Our kids are suffering. It's pathetic. Our kids are suffering. And they're doing everything to kind of, with, with getting on onto the machines and their, you know, whatever it is, to, and the mind bites that are quick, uh, you know, distractibility. Where's a centered child, a noble child who's sweet and, and being groomed in the art of dialogue and her humanity is being protected in the home space to be a, a temple and to realize that she is a sacred being, and all of her siblings are, and honor mother and father, and each other in that home sacred space, and school space, school too. As Maria Montessori wanted to create a school with a sacred child, want to educate a sacred child. And Steiner in the Waldorf was another attempt to say, a child, education should be a sacred art of raising a sacred child here. Not a curriculum, imposed on a child, but a child-centered education that allows a child to express herself in her multiple intelligences. So our love life cannot flourish, our relationships, our marriages fall apart often, even if we stayed married. 
We're not really married. To get married is to have an I thou con connection. If we get married here, we get hitched. The I it is a place of getting hitched. Single bracket marriage is not double bracket marriage. The sacred space in the eyes of God. To get married in the eyes of God, two become one. Unum pluribus is we are really two. Your other is other, but you're one. To light that, take two candles and light them as one in the sacred space. That's marriage. It's a sacred ritual for all couples, whatever gender. Gays are human, sacred beings. We all are. Gender war is a gender, you know, and then the transgender and all of those gender issues in this language can be very confusing rather than seeing the person here. As sacred humans. So I obviously feel passionate about this. I'm raising children and I'm very aware and tuned in to two generations of children and have 50 years, 55 years of experience raising two generations of children and learning from them all the way. How do you raise a human? I've been an educator, philosopher in a very great college for, for, for 49 years, working with young, brilliant people coming in, ages 18 to 22, and, and helping them to find their wings and find their voices and, and learn from the wisdom of the planet and treat them as sacred beings, and not to degrade them with grades and treat them as objects in the box, but to have liberal arts education. You've got to liberate education to liberal arts. And that's been my practice for 49 years so far in getting started. We need people across the planet to raise our children well, and each other, and to honor each other. That's a dream of all our great teachers. The fact that the human condition looks like this is indicating something is wrong. And our great teachers have known that for centuries and giving us medic medical tools to enter into the high space, whether it's the yoga technology, the Buddha technology, the Christ technology, the Logos technology of the quest to know thyself and be thyself and, and come into being and primary being of who we are, all of those teachings of the ages. We're stuck. And we're stuck because we, the implant, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen the, the depth of the single bracket technology that dominates and has us colonized. We're colonized here. And we're broken from flow and interconnection. So we have artificial relations. It's a machine-like artificial culture of space. It's like artificial intelligence, tribalism, localism, special interests, monocentric, not real sacred dialogue. So whether they're existential pathologies of existence, of just facing a death as you know it within the box, and the loss of meaning, or is it nihilism, or the angst of existence, things don't make sense, there is no meaning, and the questions of suicide, why should I live, what's the point, midlife crisis, life crashing, breakdown of human relationships, breakdown of families, and, and, and relations among humans across borders, Religious conflicts and wars and terrorism and violence and racism and sexism and slavery and, and objectifying, on and on. As diverse as they are is a main point I'm making from a medical point of view of ontology. When we're cut off from source, we're going to have dysfunctions and pathologies, psychiatric disorders, borderline. Uh, you know, I think we have to proceed with great caution here. I'm not just trying to lump it all together, but wait, what? What happens if we re-examine our psychiatric and psychotherapeutic diagnostic in psychology? And I've been playing a role in transpersonal movement, Eurotas, the transpersonal psychology movement uh, across the planet, but in Europe, uh, especially the, the self is transpersonal. What is transpersonal? The person here is transpersonal. The person here in the box is not a mensch. To become a real person, you've got to go into the transpersonal culture code and, and young. Carl Jung was open, trying to pioneer the, the, the collective unconscious and the archetypes and the anima animas in every person and to get transpersonal, the transpersonal technology going. That's an example of what, what would our disorders look like if we really understood source science and the medical ontology and our being and understand that if our being is busted, we're in trouble. One axiom. Now take a look at our 
breakdowns in the lives of our children who are suffering and feeling alienated and lost and how we violate each other and there's bullying and, and cliques forming and snob snobbing each other and, and so forth. There's, obviously there's kindness. I'm not saying there isn't kindness and, and care and love and activism and good stuff. Obviously, good stuff is going on because we're being held in the deep space. It's always calling us. We're always being called into the zone. Athletes can zone. You don't have to go through an official relinquishing <clears throat> of a smotherboard to be in the zone. We have access to the zone. We're always in the, in, in the, in the zone. We're always. We cannot not be in the infinite space. Whatever cutoff that there is from the technology of the smotherboard, and we're living in this space, the I and the not I. And, and all of our different. You know, very quickly, we get this pic picture <coughs> back, back up again. And, and, and the plus and minus here really means that if I say yes, I can say no, and that, that and we've been doing that for centuries. Having the alternative, if I say uh, the community is primary, no, the individual is primary. Is it capitalism or communism? Which is one or the other? Is it, is it the whole? Is it the, the, the community? Or we keep going into the, the, the either. Is it unity or plurality? Is it one or is it many? In, in, the, in the either or technology, this comes from the, 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 the pattern <clears throat> that we're living here. But when we realize that whatever story we're carrying, our high self is always with us. The high self, my, your high self. Whatever story you're carrying, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you're carrying here, your high self is always with you. And the journey from here into this deep well-being is to loosen up the deep, addictive attachment to this technology that gives me my life and my belief and my meaning and my truth and my identity. And is it possible to let go of that, to call it out, to see it and let go of it so that I can mature? Because my high self is always there holding us. That's huge. And that gives comfort to know. That's what faith is. Faith is confidence, confide, con fide is belief, and confide, confidence in yourself to know that your high self is with you, to know that this is here. How do you know that? Because you know that the infinite unum. Infinite, unum pluribus. When you say unum pluribus is there, the infinite diversity in the unity. What is faith? To know that there's no getting around the infinite unum. That really is like if there's one great revelation or, or insight or scientific self-evident truth that we can focus upon, it'll change everything. Because once you realize the infinite is infinite unum, then it's always with you. You can't get outside of the infinite unum. It's infinite unity. The unity holds it together, which is what? It's presence. You can't, if you can't name it here, it's presence. It's omnipresence. It's in every breath, in every grain of sand, in every breath, in every moment of time, in every locus. Wherever you are, it's sacred. If you really understood the infinite unum, the science of the infinite unum. And the infinite pluribus and diversity is sacred, and yet it's held together in the infinite unum. Infinite unity, and therefore it's right here, and therefore it's right within you. And that's why you come to the realization, and across the great religions, there's that of God in every person. Not just in every grain of sand, but every grain of man, human, man and woman. There's the infinite. Where does that come from? It's not just a wish list. It's truth. It's basic scientific truth. The infinite unum is in infinite at every point. You choose any point. It's going to be there. The infinite unum is going to be there, and you can't break it down. And even though we, we, we have a technology that seems to eclipse it, it's still always with us. And that's what we've got to look at. Is my technology immature? As great as it is in, in giving me information and belief systems and meaning and truth and identity and, and so forth, and my culture, my culture code, as great as that is, can it be holding me and retarding me and, and colonizing my true freedom to enter into the deep space? 
and awaken the, my, my intimacy with, with the source. So let this meditation just, I hope it just breathe it in. Let it sit, think about it. Be critical always, critical. Tear it apart, knock it down if you can. Be a, be a radical skeptic and blow it away because uh, the, the Udham science is that everyone has to learn at some point or other to say, I am for herself. Your mom and dad can't do it for you. No one, no guru can do it for you or should do it for you. A true guru is going to be a coach that helps you to find your own code, your own portal into the source. Because if there's that of unam in everyone, tap it, find it, release it. It's fun, it's great, it's nirvana, it's bliss. This is great news. So however much we're suffering, we're not condemned to suffering irrevocably. On the contrary, what hope this is. This is so hopeful. Unam pluribus is so hopeful. Looking at the abyss. So the person who's in a life crisis and is not finding meaning here and begins to discover herself, then meaning opens up. That's the healing of the life crisis, to find a deeper world, a deeper cultural space, to be and breathe, a right to be, to be free, nirvana. <clears throat> and that's the meditative technology of a rational, awakened being. That's global enlightenment, the source code. So I hope this helps, and I think this has not been said. What, is, what, I, what, I, what I feel is new about this narrative and di medical diagnostic is, is that the, the double bracket space and, and stepping back with a double bracket lens to now look in, with fresh eyes, not from here, looking in here and trying to understand and diagnose, but to diagnose from here. What's going on? What is addiction? Well, we are addicted to this. What does that do? It causes deep pain. It cuts us. There's a, there's, a, there's a blade cutting me from myself. I'm being cut from myself. It's, hurt, it's hurting me. And I don't even have the words to say it. I don't have, you get the words here, but I don't have the words to understand what's wrong. What am I feeling? And I drink. And I, and I, and I take sub, substances to help me to medicate. We're trying to desperately medicate. Something is wrong. And there are all kinds of reasons, of course, why someone would be having substance abuse and addictions. Uh, and our teens and our kids uh, growing up in a culture and looking around and saying, wow, this is my life in this space. Especially now with all the violence and the bombings going off all around and, and the democracy and looking to be in a meltdown. Where, where are the adults, the, we the people, holding up our human rights and our highest values of life, liberty, freedom? Where is it? The kids are going to see that. And they're going to say, why, why should I live? I'm going to get wasted. You could understand why kids would feel that. So it's time for a great healing and a great awakening in our human family, all of us. And maybe it might not happen in this century. As I said in my last closing, that if it turns out that these meditations are somehow there in the public domain, in the archive of the human a journey so that kids of the 22nd century are going to say, you know what, we're ready to be a human. We're ready to be awakened. You know, this is, this, this is not acceptable. Then so be it. I, I, feel, I feel deep peace in sharing this because I feel I speak for, with the great teachers for centuries, 2,500 years. And I'm not attached to, oh, people are going to believe it or not. That does not I, I, if anything I wish for, I wish for people to really, in their hearts, see for themselves into the Logos code within us. Tap your Logos code, your Sophia code. We're Logos sapiens, right? And it's been eclipsed and violated. And you, you should be upset about that. If you see this, you should say, wait a minute. Do I really have a right to be? Is that accessible for everyone? Or is enlightenment just for a few limited Buddhas and, and, and Krishnas and, and Jesuses and Mohammeds? Is that it? No, the great teachers were trying to say to the masses, there's a Christ within you. The Buddha was teaching to set, end the suffering on the planet for all the people. Why? Because we're Buddhas. We're humans are Buddhas. We're humans are Christ beings. We're from Allah, we're kids of Allah. Whatever name you use, and, and so we are sacred. This is sacred space. All of this is sacred space, but it's tainted. It's contaminated with patterns, 
and codes that are immature and dysfunctional and obsolete and dangerous and unsustainable and our culture here is not going to survive and thrive because this is where we thrive. And so this meditation is attempting to help us see into a deeper medical diagnostic of wide-ranging pathologies which come from being cut off and desourced. If you're desourced, you lose a continuum flow of relation into artificial pieces being hooked together in this artificial technology. And it's anemic. Life here is anemic. Life here is robust. And we know something is deeply wrong. And we're trying to get the science medically to understand and diagnose what, what is sexism? What is racism? What is homophobia? What is ethnic cleansing? What is genocide and crusades and jihads and in the name of God? Killing in the name of God. Not a good idea. Because infinite Allah, infinite God, infinite Yahweh, infinite Christ does not call for 86 saying her children. We know that's wrong. So we have to really upscript, not download, but upscript into the higher intelligence. So it's teachable, it's learnable. We, we've got the code. It needs to be activated. And it's been going on for over 2,500 years in our great teachers and scriptures, calling us to upscript. That's all of Jesus is saying, I am the way, I am the truth. Come this way, be with me, I am the way. You can't enter into the zone other than this way. This is the way. It's not I am the way, it's this is the way. So let's take a break. Thank you so much for holding with me and staying with me. And what I'd like to do in the next meditation, number 12, uh, which is if you're still willing to stay with me and go deeper, it's to show that why all attempts at activism and life coaching and self-help help. I know that there's a great billion, multi-billion dollar market for self-help to, to deal with the problems. And we have many life coaches and and gurus and teachers and coaches teaching awakening arts and how to, to tap the love and tap the now power and, and tap uh, the integral mind-body medicine and on and on. But if they're not calling out, this is a question mark to consider for next time. What we're trying to show from source science, the cumulative wisdom of the planet, is that there is a motherboard, a smotherboard, that's cutting us off from being and from smothering us, from breathing into our, our space. And the, the way to cross is to call it out. It's got to be recognized. There's no easy bypass. If there were, we would be there already. We're not there. And that shows it's not a bypass. There's no technique in here that's going to get us there. We've got to call out the smotherboard. And unless we do, we don't, we're not able to tap the power of our great teachers. We can't get the Buddha. We can't get the Christ. We can't get the yoga. We can't get the, the, the Logos journey of Socrates to know thyself. Enter the Logos, the Tao, the Allah, the roomy space. We can't get it here if we're laboring under the, the, the dominance of a, of a deep implant, thought form, mental processing plant, and, that, and colonized by it. We're not free. And we've got to see it. And you see it when you get the code. Now you can see it. You can't see it in here. You can't have a strategy in activism. Is it global warming? Is it nuclear weapons? Let's stop this. Uh, you know, whatever the crisis, we, we know the crisis, but trying to solve it in this space when it's being generated by this cut. We need a more awakened activism. And it takes vision, activision, to have activism. So activism here is not going to solve this problem. We've got to make the crossing. And it's urgent. So in the next meditation, I'm going to focus in more deeply on, on trying to look at a wide-ranging human pathologies that come from being desourced, <clears throat> and and ask how are our current coaches, life coaches and teachers and activists helping us to really do the real activism and crossing? In the political space, are we making this? This is the unfinished American Revolution. That was one of our fourth meditation. The unfinished human revolution. The unfinished American Revolution. If we're going to follow the, the founding 1776 visionary, we've got to make a crossing from America here to America here. So if we're going to be a political activist and we're trying to solve the problems in here, it's going to backfire. We've got to really go into the fire, uh, go forth into the Logos fire. For example, we should ask, if I'm a believing Christian, am I, 
I'm not listening to double bracket Jesus, the Logos voice, the Logos way. Am I a Christian here or am I a Christian here? If I'm listening to Allah and surrendering to Allah, which is surrendering, is, what do you surrender? You have to surrender your, 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 your smother board that's blocking and disrespecting Allah. That's first. You're putting your story first, your identity first. So the call across to all humanity, you got to let go of this in order to put first first. Am I really being a Muslim? Am I really being a Jew? Moses at the burning bush, I am that I am, God says, Yahweh speaks. The, the laws of God are here. The, the, the laws of ethics. Honor one another, love one another. That's the, that's the law. Are, are, are we being Jewish? Are we being Muslim? Are we being Christian? Are we being Buddha? Are we being yoga? Are we being whatever? Are we being a scientist? Or are we doing science here and claiming it's the ultimate truth and the best we've got? among the other options. <clears throat> so, in our next meditation, we're going to go and face that head on and ask, what is genuine activism? And are our spiritual guides helping us to break the barrier that we see from source science? How are they here? Because you, if you try to solve it here, you try to do the yoga here, you're not going to get the yoga. If you try to, to do the worship here and you don't understand the rite of passage into, the, into spirituality and worship and genuine worship and genuine prayer and genuine faith, then you're not getting it. So this may be troubling what I'm saying, but it has to be said. And our great teachers have been calling us, pleading with us to, to rise, to make the rite of passage, to let it go so we can rise into the genuine space of being a self and a, a dignified right. We have a right to be. And we're not being here. That's the main point. So if your coaches and self-help is going on in here, in this under this technology, it's going to hit a wall. It's going to hit this wall and that wall, and it's going to be stymied and stalled and not really tapping the medicine. To get the source medicine and release the medicine of yoga, of Christ, of Buddha, of all of our great uh, teachers who are calling us to this space, We've got to call this out and let it go. We've got to realize it's a smother board and it's dominating our lives. And we've got to name it, see it, call it out, and develop skills and st strategies of our great teachers to be mindful. Heads up. Zen. When you're Zen, you're here. You're mindful. You're living in the now time. This is the power of now. The power of Unam is the power of now. This is the love space, if you want to tap the love. This is the human right to be, the dignity. This is well-being. And the question I want to ask next time is, are our current self-help coachings and books that we're buying? And it's no question we can have a change here. We'll see you next time. There are all kinds of changes. I wasn't doing yoga. I started doing yoga, and wow, it made my life better. I didn't know Jesus. I found Jesus, and wow, my life found meaning. I wasn't doing such and such a discipline, but I'm trying martial arts, and my life has changed. Whatever it is, it's no question we can change here. There are all kinds of help and self-help and feelings of change. Oh, this is better. Before and after is like great. No question about it. We can have a different story. You have one story. Change your story. We need a new story. And I'm saying, really? Because this is where we tell our stories inside. We tell our stories here. And if we want this story and to change the story, we better change the technology of storytelling and go into the zone. That's a whole different story never told. That's what this series of meditations is trying to give us the greatest story, the unemployable story that was never told because it can't be told. This story cannot be told here. This story cannot be told here. So the greatest story of the quest for being and truth and enter presence of wisdom, of enlightenment and scripture has not been told and cannot be told. So it's not just to switch, switch gears and get another story. That's not going to do it. So in our next meditation, if, you, if I didn't scare you away <laughs> and you're willing to come back and go deeper, and I hope you will because this is huge. This is our future. This is the future of humanity, our human family, our children, our planet, our wisdom, enlightenment, reason, science. Everything that's good and noble is at stake. And next time we're going to look into activism and self-help and what does it take to really get us across that line to call out that smother boy that's slashing the hell out of us and each other 
and is producing abysmal violence. It's a violent place, and it's time to stop. So please join me next time. Thank you so much for staying with me.